Okay, perfect. I think we'll start and then um, we might have a few people join as we go along, but that shouldn't disturb anybody. So um, welcome. Uh, I'm really pleased to have Dr. Jerry Davis and Lisa Baines with me this evening for our webinar on understanding hip and elbow problems in dogs. Um, Jerry is the chief scrutineer of the British Veterinary Association and Kennel Club Hip and Elbow Dysplasia Scheme. And Lisa will become our new incoming chief scrutineer um, as we move into next year. So just a few notes before we start. Um, the Kennel Club has developed its health webinar series so that we can all hear from experts in their field and discuss really important health conditions in dogs. We want to share, learn, discuss and debate, including where feasible, hearing real life stories and answering your questions. But it's really important to say that we are not here to offer you individual veterinary advice. Please do make sure that you're registered with your local vet. And please always take your dogs to the vet if you have any concern whatsoever. All our webinars are available on the Kennel Club's YouTube channel. And um, please do go and take a look. We cover a lot of different topics. We've covered a lot of topics this year and we'll continue to add content on different areas of health as we move into next year. Please be aware um, this evening that you will not be able to speak. We can't manage hands. Um, the only way to ask any questions is either through our pre-submitted questions, which we've already have a, have a lot of to get through. Um, but if you want to ask a question and you're on the Teams app, then you can ask through the Q&A feature. Um, so we will have 45 minutes this evening for our presentations from Jerry and Lizza, and then we're going to offer 30 minutes for questions. Um, as I said, we do have a lot already to get through. So without further ado, I'm going to now hand over to Jerry and Lizza to take us through our webinar this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I hope uh, we can get everything working properly here. Um, we're going to try and give you a little bit of introduction and background uh, to the hip and elbow schemes. And I thought we might start just by talking a little bit about screening in general and perhaps a little bit of history always goes down quite well. The gentleman that you can see in the photograph is uh, 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 a now deceased but very well known veterinary surgeon in his day, Sten Eric Olsen. He was doubly qualified. He was also qualified as a uh, as a human doctor, and he specialised both in human and veterinary radiology. Um, and you will see, or you may be able to recognise, he's looking at some uh, human uh, radiograph of human breasts. And most of us are well aware of breast screening, uh, which is used in many countries, but uh, we recognise it in, in, in the UK. So it's probably quite appropriate that somebody who um, was an expert in in a screening program for breast cancer in in humans um, was really in, in one of the early instigators of looking at uh, a possible screening program for hip dysplasia in dogs. So it's quite an interesting connection. You'll see on the slide as well a little bit of a historical timeline. Hip dysplasia was recognised in the 40s and elbow dysplasia a little bit later in the 60s. Uh, um, and uh, we started the BVA HIP scheme in 1965 and it morphed into its current format in 1983 uh, and the elbow scheme uh, started in 1998. So really for the last uh, 40 and, and then 20 years for, for elbows, um, we've had the two schemes running in parallel at BVA and of course linked with the Kennel Club's data collection. So there are some general principles of screening that are worth thinking about. These are some uh, headlines really that come out of a paper that was written for the World Health Organization. So relating obviously to humans, not to animals. Um, and they were looking at screening programs for various diseases across the world. And there are one or two sort of headline points worth, worth remembering if you're trying to set up a screening test. Um, it needs to be reliable, but not necessarily a perfect test. 
So you realise that when ladies have their breasts radiographed in a mobile unit outside Tesco's, um, it's an effective test, but you could sort of say, well, everybody might go and have an MRI or an ultrasound or something much more complicated and, and labour intensive. So it needs to be a, a good test, but not necessarily a perfect or ve very best test, because we want it to reach the largest proportion of the population as possible. Because what we're talking about about here is the population of breeding dogs and we want to reach as many of them as we possibly can and the test needs to be repeatedly performed so vets across the country can hopefully produce the same results so that all the uh, the results can be compared and used to accumulate data and it needs to be economically viable i'm sure you'll all be sitting there thinking well the hip displays your now this displays your um radiographs that are taken are pretty expensive anyway but if we turn them all into ct scans or something like that they would become economically unviable it wouldn't be reasonable uh, uh, or we'd have really small numbers of dogs going through the schemes um, and we need to be able to detect affected individuals as early as possible uh, and uh, you'll realize that we have a cutoff point of a year of age and there are a very variety of reasons why we do things at, at one year of age um, but that's selected as the uh, the optimal time for uh, identifying the disease as early as possible when you use radiography now the other question that everybody asks is does it work and it's always very difficult to to uh, analyze data um, especially when the population of dogs in general we don't have all the data for them there are dogs that are owned there are dogs that are owned and registered with kennel club there are dogs that are registered with kennel club that are submitted to the schemes and there are registered dogs that aren't submitted to the schemes so to try and analyze the population data is extremely difficult um, but I've got some figures here that come from the guide dogs. I look at hip and elbow uh, images for, on their behalf um, in the same way that we look at them for the BVA Kennel Club scheme. And of course, their population of dogs is closed and they are, it's probably not the nicest word to, word to use, but they're ruthless in their selection of their breeding animals. That doesn't mean to say that they, uh, get rid of the uh, the unselected dogs they're obviously all rehomed uh, but it is a ruthless selection um, so there's no sort of oh well we like this one perhaps we'll keep it going its hips aren't that bad and so on and so forth but if you've got a closed population like the guide dogs have and you are very very ruthless in your selection of um, uh, of the dogs that you're going to breed from you can see that the number of the instance of hip dysplasia cases in their puppies and an instance of elbow displacement cases in their puppies has been falling steadily over this period that uh, of about 20 years that these data have been turned into graphs for you so i think there is good evidence from those data to suggest that it does work but it's not going to work as effectively as that in the rather wider population uh, uh, of dogs out in the uh, owned by the general public. There are some other difficulties that we have to face with um, uh, hip and elbow dysplasia in as, in as much that they are multifactorial diseases. It's not just a hereditary story. Um, if you had a disease that was controlled purely by genetics, it would be very easy to eliminate it quite quickly by uh, careful selection. Um, so the, we will talk a little bit later on perhaps about uh, the various other things other gen than genetics that contribute to the disease but because they're multifactorial uh, it, it may well be that you happen to select you know, are very careful in your selection of breeding stock but you will still from time to time uh, find cases of hip and elbow dysplasia popping up sporadically uh, through those breeding populations. We've also got difficulty, I've, I've said that we can't, uh, we don't know what's happening in the general population of dogs out across the UK. We have no data of the total population. 
Um, so we've got no population compliance. Um, we need to have breeder compliance. We don't have, it's not compulsory for all breeders to have their dogs uh, health tested. If it were, then the schemes would work. They'd be even more effective. Um, of course, for, uh, you know, all the, uh, the sorts of people that will be listening tonight, I'm sure uh, we're preaching to the converted already. But the more breeders that uh, do uh, comply with the with the schemes to in, in get involved with the schemes, uh, the better the results will be that come out at the other end. And it's also vets that can be criticised as well because some vets trying to be helpful to their clients may well radiograph dogs and say, I don't think those hips or those elbows look very good. Maybe there's no point in you spending money sending them into BVA. But ideally, so that we've got all the data that we need and we can get the best advice from those data, we should send in every single dog's radiographs uh, that are available. We shouldn't be filtering out the bad ones because it will skew the, uh, the data that we're working from. And of course, the test needs to be uh, a sensitive test. And I've already said that radiography uh, is not ideal, but it is. Um, easy to be uh, carried out and it's reasonably uh, economically viable um, so we can't use the more expensive and uh, complex tests even though they might be better so why is it important to screen well we're trying to reduce the incidence of two not very helpful diseases hip dysplasia and elbow disease elbow dysplasia across uh, numbers of breeds that are susceptible and if we screen the parents for breeding, we hopefully will produce or maximise the number of healthy offspring. But we have to remember that the uh, the appearance of the parents uh, doesn't necessarily tell the whole, whole story. We may have a dog who's got very good looking hips and very good looking elbows who may still produce some offspring with poor hips or elbows. And that may be to do with the complications of the, ge the heritability, the genetics behind it, and also the multifactorial issues that we've mentioned already. Um, so we need to test offspring too, so that we can prove the parent. So if we look at the offspring from a number of, uh, from a, a mating, uh, then we can see that the offspring are, have got good hips and elbows. That will add further weight to the previous selection of those parents as good dogs to breed from. And then we need to publish the data that uh, there's no point in uh, having these these animals tested and then not not giving the information out to the to the general uh, population of breeders. They need to be able to see what's going on, which will help them select the dogs that they want to to use in their breeding programs. And of course, what we all want to do is improve the health of of the breeds and and dogs overall both these diseases are painful when the dogs develop arthritis later in life um, it would be much nicer so that we could eliminate uh, the diseases completely so that there would be uh, much less instance of painful arthritis i'm going to talk a little bit about elbows in particular and leave the hips to at the back end of the dog to lizard a bit later on um, Dysplasia really is just a sort of fancy medical term for saying that something isn't the right shape. It's a malformation, and in this case, elbow dysplasia, a malformation of the elbow joints. It nearly always affects both joints, both the left and the right elbow, so it's usually bilateral. And it may lead to fragments in the joint, so those are lo loose bits of uh, bone and cartilage that float about in the joints and you can imagine uh, those can uh, cause a, a deal of damage. But the deformity in the joint will inevitably cause secondary what's called osteophytosis, so little bony spurs uh, attached to the skeleton, uh, but they make the surface of the joint rough and uncomfortable. Of course, this is what we then generally call osteoarthritis. An osteoarthritis is a joint, an osteoarthritic joint is a joint that's got a rough surface, a lot of inflammation, and the inflammation is, is painful, 
and the joint surfaces degrade, the cartilage wears away, and eventually you have bone on bone contact, which is extraordinarily painful uh, and what leads to people and some animals having joint replacements. So why do we care about elbow dysplasia? Well, one thing it does is it really does reduce the range of motion of the joint. Um, you'll be able to tell that as the, as the arthritis uh, increases and progresses, uh, the amount that the, the, the dog can bend its elbow, flex its elbow will reduce. And that alone will affect the gait. It's what you might call a mechanical lameness. And lameness will come from that loss of range of motion, but lameness also comes from the pain uh, from the arthritis that's developing within the joint. So elbow arthritis is a very painful and debilitating disease and it would be much nice to prevent it happening rather than to go around looking for clever cures like elbow replacement surgery. So what are the causes? We keep talking about it being multifactorial. Well, there's a heritable component and I guess you could say the genetic part of it is ab about half of uh, the causation, but there are or other uh, elements of uh, causation, which include diet, the environment, the activity of the of the of the animal, uh, what sort of weight gain. That's not its absolute weight. It's more whether it's growing extremely quickly. Um, and diet and weight gain obviously uh, 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 tend to be linked uh, together. That's the quantity in the diet and the quality of the diet. And confirmation is interesting as far as elbow dysplasia is concerned, because some dogs, we think about hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia mostly affecting large breed dogs. Um, but the dogs with the rather shorter bandier legs, uh, they look like they've got antique furniture front legs. Um, often that bendiness, which is quaint and nice to look at, and we, if we think about the Dachshund would be an extreme version of a bandy leg dog or a basset hound. One element of that conformational disturbance that creates that shape and uh, uh, appearance of that breed can be um, an incongruity, a poor fitting together of the elements of the elbow joint. So the upper arm, the humerus, has to articulate with the radius and ulna. And in some conformations, uh, that articulation is inaccurate and the joint space will not be even. And of course, that will lead to arthritis as well. So thinking about the conformation of the animals we breed is important. And another difficulty that we face is some dogs may have elbow dysplasia and not be obviously symptomatic. And so we may not realise that they are actually uh, have the problem. Any of these diseases that affect both legs, of course, lameness becomes much more difficult to detect if both legs uh, are equally affected, unless you're an absolute expert at analysing uh, uh, motion and, and, uh, and gait. It's very easy for it to be missed until somebody actually manipulates the leg and finds that with elbows, maybe they don't flex as much as they should and or the dog is, you know, shows that it's painful when you move the leg about. So when we're screening for ED, what uh, are we looking for? Well, we follow the parameters that were described by the International Elbow Working Group, the IEWG, and those are followed really by all the schemes across the world. Um, and they, they uh, um, are based upon three uh, or originally were based upon three views of the elbow. You'll see the two views at the top of the slide are what we call lateral views. So they're looking from the side of the dog. And one of the views is a flexed view. That's the tightly angled view that we've got here. And the other one is a neutral view with the leg more, more or less extended in a sort of normal, nearly standing position. Now, another view is the view that is taken from the front of the dog to the back, 
which we call a craniochordal view. Now, this view is very difficult to actually create for the radiographer. And we decided in the UK to drop this from the scheme because a large number of the animals that were uh, people were hoping to submit, uh, the view was uh, not accurately positioned and then didn't fit the, uh, uh, the parameters that the scheme required. So in the UK, we rely on these two views uh, to determine whether or not we think the dog has elbow dysplasia. And the main indication on all three of these views of elbow dysplasia being present are the secondary osteoarthritic changes. We can look for sclerosis, which is bone whitening. So these areas that are white, and that's very difficult to be sure whether they're as white as they should be, or are they whiter than white? It's a very subjective uh, um, assessment. An incongruity, which is when I was talking about confirmation as to whether the joint space, that's the dark area between the bones, whether that's a good shape or whether it's incongruent. That also is a challenging thing to determine. And we will occasionally actually see a primary lesion, which is a loose piece of bone within the joint. Um, but most of the assessment is about the secondary osteoarthritis. Now, some dogs do go to CT scan and the CT scan will tell us, give us an awful lot more information uh, about what's going on in an elbow dysplastic joint. Uh, and the experience that we've gained from looking at CT scans has made our identification of abnormalities on radiographs better than it used to be. So we're still learning and informing ourselves as how to interpret what we see on the radiographs based on extra information we get from CT scanning. So here are some examples for you. Um, we've got a left elbow, which is, is a normal elbow. It's this, this is the same dog. Uh, and the right elbow, which is abnormal. And it really is quite subtle, but on the back of the, what we call the anconeal process of the, uh, of the ulna here, there is some new bone. If you look terribly closely, very, very carefully, just beyond the red arrow, there's some bony material just here which you won't see on the other side. And this is the secondary arthritic bone that's being developed from this dysplastic joint. And it measures less than two millimeters in depth. So that is a grade one dog. Here is the same sort of material, another dog, but this is the same bony material being, being deposited on the back of the ulna, but it's bigger than it is in the last dog. And if it measures between two and five millimetres, that dog then becomes an elbow dysplasia grade two dog. And grade three dogs have large, large deposits of new bone. So this one we can see the new bone tucked away at the back on the ankyneal process again. There's also a huge lump of new bone on the radius here, this big lump that I'm outlining shouldn't be there. That's bony arthritic bone that's being deposited. And I've thrown in a craniochordal view just for your interest to show the arthritic bone that's developed down the medial aspect, the inside aspect of the elbow uh, in this case. And you'll see that there are actually some loose fragments. They're not attached to the bone like these are. And these are fragments of bone that have come off the coronoid process. Now, if the lump of new bone is bigger than five millimetres, like this one, that will give us a grade three on its own. And if we ever see any loose fragments, and we sometimes, and the CT has helped us learn this, we can sometimes see loose, loose fragments in here, then it becomes a grade three dog. You'll notice that what we call a flexed view here isn't very well flexed in this dog. And the reason it's not flexing well is because of this great big lump of bone, new bone that's developed here. So that's one thing that you would notice in the dog in real life. If you tried to bend his elbow as far as it should flex, it won't flex as much as it should because there's a lot of arthritic bone there. So I'm going to hand over now to um, uh, Lizza to give you a little bit of an intro about hip dysplasia. 
she'll be telling me to move the slide, so uh, I'll try and keep my ears open. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Good, Good evening, evening everybody. everybody. So first of all, I'd like to just talk about what is hip dysplasia, just as Jerry went through elbow dysplasia. Um, so hip dysplasia, as Jerry said, dysplasia means something has grown or developed wrongly. So it's abnormal development of the hip joints. And again, in most animals, it's usually bilateral. What that results in is instability in the hip joint. You might get some looseness in the muscles and the ligaments around the hip joint, and then the femoral head, the top part, the ball part of the um, ball and socket joint, and I'll show you some examples of that at the moment, may become malformed. So it becomes misshaped. Instead of a nice round ball, it becomes an odd, almost triangular shape on some animals. And that kind of then rattles around a bit in the hip socket. Following on from this instability of the joint, similar to the elbow, we then can end up with the development of degenerative joint disease, this osteoarthritis. As Jerry said, that's a very painful condition. Hip dysplasia can manifest in young animals or indeed in older dogs, depending on how much arthritis they develop and due to also other factors about exercise and diet. But any dog breed can be affected and it also is can affect cats, but it is more clinically significant in the larger and the heavier breeds. And you can imagine why that is. If you're, you've got 50% or at least 50% of your body weight going through a joint which is painful, or the two hip joints which are painful, then the more weight there is going through a painful joint, the more significant that's going to be to that particular animal. Thank you, Jerry. So why do we care? Well, as we've said, it's a significant cause of lameness in dogs, and we'd like to avoid any of our dogs being uncomfortable or painful in any way. When you're a young, when the animals are young, if they're severely affected, you may have an abnormal way of walking with this kind of loose, kind of sl um, slinky hipped appearance to walking. Um, so a gait abnormality. And then in time, they will also show pain and you'll see active lameness when they're walking. If they go on to develop arthritis when they're older, then they definitely will be uncomfortable. And you'll have animals that find they they spend a lot of time lying down and shifting around in the evenings, perhaps when and not liking to lie on hard surfaces, um, tending more want to lie on the rug in front of the fire to make themselves more comfortable. So these are all signs that your animal may be in pain. But it is important to remember that not all animals with dysplasia will show clinical signs. And that's one of the reasons why it's important to take radiographs in order to screen for disease before we're thinking about breeding from our pets. It is then also important to remember that there's no direct correlation between the level of radiographic change, which we see, and the degree of lameness. Some dogs, we might see hardly any arthritis at all on a radiograph, but these animals are significantly lame because of the looseness of the joint. And equally, other animals may have severe arthritic change on a radiograph, but in fact, they seem to be, excuse me, seem to be coping with that change. And it might just be that they've adapted and they're learning to flex their knees and their ankles more to take away from the fact that their hips don't um, flex as well as they should do. But you can't really directly correlate the clinical significance of a lameness with the radiographic changes that are visible. Thank you, Joe. So exactly the same as elbow dysplasia, we've talked a lot about how there are multifactorial reasons for animals to get hip dysplasia. There definitely is a heritable component, and that means that genetics always play a part. And I think an animal won't develop hip dysplasia if there's not that genetic propensity there. You don't just get an animal getting it out of the blue. You need to have that genetic weakness, if you like, present in the hip. And then the amount of clinical significance it has in that animal will be affected by what it eats, how much it eats, the kind of exercise it gets, how heavy a breed it is, and also perhaps the environment to a lesser degree, but how soft its bed is, um, how much padding it has, and, and how comfortable it is generally. And again, just like the elbows, dogs may be affected, but we may not see that, the so-called clinically silent animals. And they are very important to identify with the radiography because otherwise you might think, oh, this dog's fine. There's no evidence of lameness. I'm going to breed from it. And in fact, you are um, continuing to, um, can't think of the word, propagate hip dysplasia through the breed because you haven't identified the fact that this animal is a carrier. And 
you know, that's been seen in other breeds with other conditions. Um, before Cavaliers, they identified a lot of heart disease in them. There were uh, several animals in the 70s that were used a lot before they realised that there was a problem in the breed because it wasn't being picked up. So it is important to screen animals before we breed from them. I was trying to move the slide on there. Thank you, Jerry. So what do we mean by a dysplastic joint? Well, we know this is a malformed joint where the sides of the bone that create the joint don't fit together properly. In a normal hip joint, and this is a beautiful example of a normal hip, we've got this is a what we call a ventrodorsal view of the pelvis. So the animal is had this radiograph taken when it's lying on its back with the hind limbs extended out. And you can see nicely that the hind limbs are sitting very parallel to each other and the pelvis itself is very symmetrical. There's no tilt or angulation on this dog at all. And when we look at the hip joints individually, we can appreciate that the femoral head appears as nearly a round ball. Um, it's not quite a ball because that's not doesn't exist in nature, but it's nearly a round ball sitting very deep, thank you, Jerry, in the deep cup or socket of the acetabulum. And that's the part of the pelvis that the femoral head engages with in the acetabulum. When we look at the joint space and we see that particularly on the front edge of the joint, we should see a parallel joint space of the thin curved um, blacker line that Jerry is highlighting there, which is what we call the joint space, where the articular cartilage, the cartilage within the joint, rubs against each other and it should be a very smooth surface. And we look at the edges of the bone in the femoral head and in the acetabulum, and they should be very clean and smooth, no irregularity or spurs of new bone sticking out. Thank you. Whereas in an abnormal hip joint, what we will have is the cup or socket of the acetabulum looks much shallower, um, more like a saucer or a dish. And there is reduced congruity, reduced contact between the ball of the femoral head and the socket of the acetabulum. And you can see here that the femoral head is sitting out of the joint and there's not that smooth contact between the ball and the socket. We can get as part of secondary change, some new bone developing around the joint margins. Now, this patient doesn't have a lot of new bone, a little bit on the femoral neck um, and a little bit on the edge of the acetabulum. Um, but this is relatively young dog without a lot of secondary change. But what we can see in this patient is quite a lot of remodeling of the bones. Instead of that nice crisp edges, we're seeing some edges that are slightly blurred, particularly on the front of the acetabulum. It just looks a bit rounded off if we compare it to what we saw on the previous radiograph. And in time, as we've said, secondary degenerative change, osteoarthritic change will develop. Thank you. So I'm now going to talk a little bit more about the actual procedure of getting your animals scored. I know you know the side when you go to the vet and have the radiographs taken, but just to take you through it from our side. So with both elbow and hip, the um, procedure is the same. Obviously the radiographs taken are different, but otherwise apart from that, um, what happens at our end is the same. Nearly every single radiograph now is submitted via the portal on the BBA website. And you know, the fee has to be paid before the radiographs can be submitted through to the screen. The images are checked in the office to ensure they match the paperwork. Obviously, nowadays, that's a digital certificate, but to make sure that the animal on the radiograph is the same as the animal stated on the portal. And when it comes through to the scrutineers, then each image is assessed for acceptable quality. We need to make sure that we can see those details that Jerry's talked about in the elbows and that I've mentioned in the hips. So we need to make sure the animal is positioned appropriately with the right views in the elbows we need that extended or neutral lateral view and the flexed lateral view and um, on the hips we need that nice and straight ventrodorsal view with the dog lying on its back and those hind legs nice and parallel with each other we also want to make sure that the radiographic quality um, things like the exposure settings of the x-ray machine have been appropriate so we can see the details now before we even start to grade or score the radiographs we need to make sure we check that the quality of the radiograph is acceptable. And there may be a little bit of variation that will allow um, in positioning because we want to make sure that the patient is not submitted to repeat 
sedation or general anaesthesia if it's not essential. If we feel that there is sign of disease there that we're not going to, even if we got a radiograph that was perfectly straight, it's not going to change the score that we're going to get. This animal is already diseased. So there's no point in risking it with another sedation or anaesthetic. And also there's obviously increased cost if you have to have the radiographs repeated. And then once we're happy with the quality of the film, we will then grade or score, depending on the scheme, according to the BVA and Kennel Club canine health schemes. Thank you. So we talk about elbow grades and we talk about hip score. So that's why I keep using those two terms. What we have every time we score and grade, we have two of us working together and we come to a consensus. We agree with the score that we're giving. So you've got that kind of nice backup of having two people looking at every single case. There are several of us, 10 of us on the panel at the moment. And so the you don't just work with the same person all the time. It, the, the scrutineers rotate round with different pairings. And again, that gives us a broad bank of experience at looking at these images and making sure that we're not, well, I don't think anybody's to ever do any bullying, but there's always going to be agreement but, and discussion between us, which is great. There's the chief scrutineer, which, as you know, is currently Jerry and will be soon next year, um, me. And if there are any queries from the scrutineers, then they can ask for advice or adjudication from the chief scrutineer. And as you may be aware, there is a formal appeal process for the owner. If you're unhappy with the score that you get, you can appeal. And the details for the appeals is all on the BBA website in the Canine Health Scheme section. Um, and what happens if you appeal is the radiograph is reviewed by at least three other people, including the chief scrutineer. And then we decide or it's decided whether or not a different score should be given or whether the original score is upheld. Um, so there is the opportunity to appeal if you're not happy with the decision that's been made. There is a certain amount of quality control that goes on. As I said, this continual rotation of the scrutineers means that um, we're all sharing knowledge and information all the time. And the chief scrutineer monitors the appeals and uses any appeals to at the annual meeting that the scrutineers all have to discuss where things might have been changed or where we think that um, scores might have been different and come to an agreement with how we're viewing things. So it's to make sure that we're continually learning ourselves on how we should be reporting these radiographs. Thanks, Joe. So when we're scoring hips, it's a bit more complicated than the elbows. There are nine different things that we look at, and we look at those nine things on the right hip and those nine things on the left hip, and we generate a total score um, from the scores for each hip individually. And from all the scores of any dog of a single breed, we generate what are called breed specific statistics. And those are what you're aware of if you're breeding dogs, that you end up with a breed mean or breed median score, um, which gives you a number below which it's better to select your animals for breeding. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. So the nine parameters are listed on the certificate and we've recreated here just a, a part of the digital certificate you get. The Norberg angle is the first one and that looks at the overall depth of the acetabulum and how well the femoral head, head fits into that socket. Subluxation is again how deep the femoral head is sitting in and how deep the socket is. And cranial acetabular edge, which I know you remember Jerry highlighting that smooth parallel curved gray line on the radiograph. That's what we're looking at when we talk about cranial acetabular edge. And it's important to remember that those first three parameters that we look at, they're the main ones that are assessing what we call primary disease, the level of primary hip dysplasia and how badly affected each hip is. The other six criteria assess the secondary change, the osteophytosis and osteoarthritis that we've talked about. So when we're looking, so then after that, we look at the dorsal acetabular edge, which is the top margin of the joint, the cranial effective acetabular rim, which is the intersection between the dorsal and the cranial acetabular edges. We look at the acetabular fossa, which is the um, 
area where the femoral head sits into the acetabulum, the caudal acetabular edge, which is the back bit of the acetabulum. And then we look at new bone on the femoral head and neck, and we look at remodeling of the femoral head and neck. And I talked a bit about that at the beginning, how in time, if the bone contact is not congruent, if the joint is uh, dysplastic, then you end up with the bone having to change shape to try and make itself fit in better. So those second six parameters are all looking at osteoarthritis, really, and the secondary effects of the primary dysplasia change. And that's really important to remember, because if you have a, an animal that has an overall score of, I don't know, 18, and your breed mean is currently 18, you might think, oh, well, it, or maybe 19, you think, oh, well, I'm just under the breed median, I'll be okay to breed. But if your score of your animal is made up of 666666, in those first three criteria, three lots of sixes for the right. Oh no, they wouldn't be right, so it's 18. So three, 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 and three, three, three. So three for the first three criteria on the right, and three for the first three criteria on the left, and the rest of the certificate is on noughts, then that animal should not be bred from because that is a significant primary dysplasia score. It just hasn't had time yet to develop the secondary osteoarthritis. So it's really important to be aware of the, the first three criteria, the ones that show us the degree of dysplasia more than the subsequent ones. Thank you, Jerry. So here is just a schematic to show how we measure Norberg angle, the image on the left. We connect the centers of the femoral heads and then measure a line between the center of the, that joint junction line and the cranial effective acetabular rim point there. And that shows us the depth of the acetabulum and the femoral head congruency within that joint. And then the image on the right is just showing us the different criteria. A is cranial acetabular edge showing, and we talked about how we had that curved radiolucent um, joint space, sort of grayed out joint space. B is um, looking at the dorsal acetabular edge. Um, C is the cranial effective acetabular rim, the intersection between the dorsal edge and the cranial acetabular edge. D is the acetabular fossa, looking at the depth there of the acetabulum and how well the femoral head sits in. E is the caudal acetabular edge. And F shows us the femoral head and neck exostoses, which is new bone arthritis changes coming around the femoral head and neck. And I haven't highlighted um, femoral head and neck remodeling, but you could imagine if that rounded femoral head was remodeled, it would look a bit triangular or a bit blocky, but that's a nice smooth head. I kind of raced through the criteria somewhat. I do apologize. Thank you, Jerry. So we've talked about um, getting the individual dogs scored. And we're now looking at how we use the data from the hip dysplasia scheme. We don't have a single global score for all dogs because, as Jerry's talked about conformation in the elbows, breeds, there's a lot of variation between different breeds and the different conformation of the pelvis. Things like a greyhound, which has a beautiful, elegant, smooth pelvis with nice, deep um, acetabular and the femoral head sitting in there. And then something like a bulldog, which has a slightly more flared out pelvis with less congruency between the femoral head and the acetabulum. So a score of eight for a greyhound would be, I mean, obviously good, but not amazing. Whereas a score for eight for a bulldog would be really amazing because they tend to have hips that score more highly, just because mainly because of confirmation. So you need to have a range for each breed that's appropriate to breed from. But in order to develop the breed median score, the breed specific statistics, we must have every radiograph that's taken submitted. And Jerry mentioned this already. But the more radiographs we have, the more data is available. And the more data there is, the more accuracy, because we're getting an idea of a larger proportion of the population. If we don't submit every radiograph, we don't score every dog, even if that if the radiograph looks like it's going to get a bad score. And what happens is that the breed specific statistics will be falsely depressed because if you're not scoring, if you're not you're scoring the more affected animals, then you think, oh, oh well, 
the worst thing that you have in, in a German Shepherd ever is a 40. Oh, so that's OK. So the breed mean is falsely pushed down. And that potentially removes animals from the breeding pool, which actually would be appropriate to breed from. Now, if you have a breed that has a lot of animals that have been scored, like the Labrador, then I, I think, you know, being stricter about the breed median and breeding from animals that are even further, further down below the breed median is fine because there are lots of Labradors, but with the smaller numbered breeds, you don't want to be excluding animals that could be adding into that data because severely affected animals, really severely affected animals, will be identified before they even get to 12 months old. So before they've had the opportunity to be scored. And so those are being excluded from the gene pool and from our data already. So the more radiographs we can score, the better quality our data is. The Canine Health Scheme, the BBI Kennel Club scheme has been going, as Jerry said, a long time. So we have a lot of animals in many breeds, which gives us a more accurate breed median score. So the more animals that are scored, the better for that breed. The Kennel Club also generate estimated breeding values, which Charlotte knows much more about than I do. And they also help us a lot with giving us a more accurate guide as to the suitability of individual planned mating. So the EBVs on the Kennel Club website are a really, really useful tool. But the generation of EBVs relies on our radiographic data. Thank you, Jerry. So just to finish off, just a couple of examples or three examples of different types of hips. This is an Italian Spinoni, which scored naught. It had effectively perfect hips. And if you can appreciate the beautiful congruency of the femoral head sitting deep into an acetabulum, beautiful contact between the smooth line of the cranial acetabular edge and the femoral head, and no evidence of any new bone, any spiky bits of new bone on any of the any of the margins of our skeleton and anything scruffy. It looks very smooth and neat, doesn't it? I think. Thank you, Jerry. This one was a golden retriever and these hips to perhaps to some people's eyes don't look too bad. There's not a lot of scruffiness, but I hope that you can appreciate from what we've said so far that the femoral head is sitting quite wide out of the acetabulum. Um, the acetabulum looks very shallow, more like a kind of cereal bowl than a deep cup um, and the edges of the bone have some new bone on them. So for the cranial effective acetabular rim, which Jerry's highlighting there, has a little osteophyte and we've got new bone on the femoral neck and coming all the way around the femoral neck there all the way. We can see and that looks scruffy and messy compared with the previous study. And this dog actually scored 75, which I think when you first look at this, you might be surprised, but this was because it's like, oh, well, it's not terrible. There's not loads of arthritis, but it's a very, very dysplastic dog. It's very shallow acetabular, very luxated or, or displaced femoral heads. And finally, the last one from me, I think, is this was a Labrador. And this again has very dysplastic hips. We can see that the femoral heads are sitting out of the acetabular, but this also has a lot more arthritis. We can really appreciate a gigantic osteophyte, a gigantic spur of new bone on the cranial effective acetabular rim, also the caudal acetabular rim. The acetabular fossa is filled in um, there, thank you. And we can see a large collar of new bone coming all the way around the femoral neck there. And the femoral heads don't look like nice smooth balls anymore, do they? They look like funny kind of wedgy things um, with the, almost rectangular with big spurs on the medial aspect and inside aspect. Great. Anyway, I'll hand back to Jerry just to wrap up. Oh, you're muted, Jerry. Still muted. Hello? Yes, not muted anymore. I'm sorry about that. I must have uh, decided it was going to do that of its own accord. I'll be back. I'll be back like. Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
There we go. So looking to the future, well, one thing that we've been almost uh, by accident uh, had to put our skates on. Everyone will remember, of course, the difficulties during the pandemic of postal services and people being able to get together to uh, to work in uh, in close quarters. Um, and so we developed uh, uh, a prototype remote scoring. So Liz and I, as a pair, for instance, could sit at home uh, and score images as a pair, as usual, but one of us near Birmingham and one, with it, one of us near Bedford. Um, and that uh, is progressing. We prefer to do it in person uh, together. Uh, it's a much uh, more satisfying way of dealing with it. But we have as a backup now a remote scoring opportunity, uh, which will help us with pandemics, train strikes, illnesses, or, or any other sort of hiccup that there might be. We're all hearing about AI and chat GTP and, and all these uh, uh, clever things that are going on. And uh, we're all worried about whether we're going to lose our jobs to computers in the future. Um, and artificial intelligence has been used for looking at uh, medical images. And again, breast cancer screening is was one of the first things that uh, it was looking at, um, just as Sten Eric there with his radiographs a long, long time ago. Um, but you'll see in the orange writing that uh, uh, a review that was uh, looking at the accuracy of AI in, in breast screening, uh, which was published in 2021, did throw up some nervousness uh, as to accuracy and was this really the, the way things are going to go. I guess almost inevitably, as the AI, AI systems become more sophisticated and more reliable, things will move in that direction. Um, even if it's only for fishing out the iffy cases, uh, so the obviously normal, the machine may be able to deal with, and then the radiologist will still be asked to double check the, uh, the cases that are, uh, 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 are worrying uh, the machine. Alternative imaging, we've mentioned CT earlier on, um, and CT certainly, particularly for elbows, is a much, much better test, but it is her horrendously expensive um, and uh, isn't, at least at the moment, uh, a, an appropriate, uh, uh, from a cost point of view, uh, means of uh, reaching a large number, a large proportion of the population, which we now all realise is a, a very important factor in screening. And it's no good having a perfect test that only reaches a couple of dogs. It would be better to have a less than perfect test that reaches thousands and thousands of dogs. And genetic testing, well, there's a problem here that we keep banging on about, that it's a multifactorial disease. And so the genetic testing isn't perhaps going to test, uh, going to fish out all the information that we, we need to know for our selection. Uh, but it may be that uh, suitable genetic testing will be something that can be added into the mix at some point. But at this stage, at least for hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia, and maybe some other diseases, it's uh, uh, a little bit further ahead. But for HD and ED, uh, it's a, still a thing of the future. But that obviously would be wonderful if you could do it with a saliva test uh, or a, blood, a simple blood test uh, without having to resort to sedation, anesthesia and radiography, but they're things that may be out there on the horizon for the future. So I think we can hand back to um, to Kennel Club. Uh, the, this is the last slide. There is a little bit of information there uh, for you to link up to the Canine Health Schemes. Uh, I think this information will be available outside the webinar itself. Uh, so if you haven't got time to scan the QR code or write down the bit.ly link, uh, don't worry, it'll get to you eventually. Jerry, thank you both, um, Liza and Jerry. Um, huge topic. I'm sure that we're going to revisit this in future. Um, but while we have you, we have got 20 minutes. So I'm going to ask some of our pre-submitted questions. Um, firstly, commonly asked of the Kennel Club, I'm sure at the BVA as well, um, about puppies and young dogs. Um, in regard to hip and elbow dysplasia. So we've had questions 
um, come in before our webinar this evening on is it safe to let puppies go up and down stairs? Um, what difference um, does surfaces make in terms of dogs or puppies, young adults playing on different surfaces, walking um, on pavements? And generally about appropriate exercise for puppies, which I know is slightly outside of our topic tonight. But if there's anything specifically you want to say about puppies and young adults um, in regard to hip and elbow dysplasia. I think perhaps I'll start by saying it may be appropriate that we heard from the government today, that they've appointed the Minister for Common Sense. Um, I don't know whether who else has heard or read that, but really the answer to this question is common sense. Um, obviously young puppies, uh, young babies, young children, uh, young horses have softer skeletons and joints than an adult, and therefore they're more vulnerable to impact uh, in particular. And so it's more about thinking what sorts of extreme activities should we avoid. So leaping down stairs, missing out the bottom three and landing with a big jolt at the bottom isn't a good idea. If you have to use the stairs, well, some people live in flats, that's got going to happen. So making sure that the dog walks sensibly up and down the stairs. If it can't be sensible, it may need to be on a lead or carried. Um, when you're out walking, yes, exercise is good for growing young, healthy animals, um, but don't do an excess of it. And if you're going to uh, do some uh, entertainment activities, then uh, throwing balls with uh, those projectiles that will throw the ball about 400 yards. Uh, probably better just to use an underarm uh, throw of the uh, of the object so it doesn't go too far. So it's everything in moderation. Uh, don't uh, cut everything, you know, don't cut out exercise. That would be bad, but don't do anything in extremes. Perfect, thank you. Lisa, do you want to add anything? Uh, the only thing I would add is... I completely agree with obviously everything Jerry said, but it's also there's so much breed variation. So something like a German Shepherd or a Springer Spaniel has a lot of energy and can do a bit more than perhaps, I don't know, a French Bulldog who needs to be a bit more restricted. So you need to take into account the size and type of your dog as well as its age. And um, when you're thinking about the type of exercise and the amount of exercise it should be doing. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. OK, moving on. Um, We've had a question about an external physical examination. Obviously, you've you've gone into a lot of depth on the value of the scheme this evening. Um, but just to cover off this point at the end of the webinar, um, we've been asked, is it possible to diagnose hip and elbow dysplasia in a puppy or even in an adult um, with an external physical examination? Shall I start this on, Jerry, and you can butt in oh, as necessary? Right. We can. I'll, I'll start at the front, and you can you can move to the oh, back. Okay. I mean, I did mention Fine. we were talking about the elbows that um, when the uh, arthritis has developed significantly, then the elbow won't bend very well, and that's something that anybody could find out. But unfortunately, that's dependent on all that new bone, arthritic bone, developing, and in a young puppy, that won't be there. The elbow dysplasia may well be there but the interference with the range of motion, how much the bed joint will bend, won't really have been developed by then. So even at a year of age, which is when we're recommending um, the elbow to be radiographed for assessment, um, the range of motion tests, how much the elbow bends, um, will have limit, limit limitations to it. But if it's really bad, then it, it will be affected and you may be able to tell it. Um, but uh, I, I would say that for elbows, there isn't a reliable means of even an expert uh, uh, being able to tell other than maybe a pain response. If the, if the elbow is painful, something's obviously wrong and it might be elbow dysplasia. Perfect. Is that moving on to the hip? Um, <laughs> certainly if dogs are severely affected, you can identify hip laxity or hip looseness in a puppy. It is a slightly painful test to do, um, so you you're, you may not get your patient to comply with the test, but you can identify. And they do this test in 
newborn babies as well in the hospital when they're looking for um, evidence of hip laxity in newborns, they'll do a test. So there are um, there's a, the Ortolani test and there's the Barden's hip lift test. So these are tests that your vet could do. Um, but you have to have quite an advanced degree of hip laxity present before you'll be able to pick this up clinically, particularly in a non sedated animal. Um, and so you might not see that. You certainly won't see the subtle um, degrees of hip dysplasia, which we talked about, which are really, in my opinion, the more important ones perhaps to be trying to pick up because the ones that aren't clinically showing signs but still have the propensity to develop it are the ones that we really want to get rid of out of the breeding population. If you have an older animal that's developed a lot of arthritis, then as Jerry said, you will get resistance to movement of the hips and your vets will often try and extend the leg behind them. So you stand with the animal in front of you and you extend the leg behind itself. And a lot of animals will resent that movement, but then you don't know if that's got arthritis because of hip dysplasia or arthritis because of another reason. So um, radiographs are really the best way of identifying the primary changes and the secondary changes in dogs. Thank you for that. Um, just going back to age, um, we've had a number of questions before the webinar and also a couple in the Q&A this evening. I didn't know if there was anything else you wanted to say around the age, um, potentially the, the progressive nature um, of hip dysplasia. And I didn't know whether there was anything you wanted to specifically touch on in terms of um, the optimal ages to have the dogs um, scored. Well, the screen, the both schemes, they can't be radiographed and submitted until they're at least a year old. And really, I think it's best to do it as soon as they qualify for the scheme, because then you're identifying the potential for problems in that individual animal. The screening programmes as a rule are to try and look at breeding animals rather than individual. But I think if you're aware that your animal has signs of, of dysplasia, whether it's hip or elbow, then you as the owner can then manage it appropriately and see what your vet recommends from the point of view of treatment and exercise regime to try and stop the progression because as we talked about we're trying to use this programs to reduce the disease in the breed but it's also important to think about the individual animal and how to make that animal the most comfortable if it has got either elbow or hip dysplasia so I think the sooner you find out about that really the better. Perfect. And a quick question for you. I know we have this information online, but while we're on the webinar, how much does it cost um, generally oh. to have your dog hip scored? Frankly, I don't know. Hey, Liz, <laughs> that that side of things completely out of me, I'm afraid. It's, we uh, we sorry, have this on. information in our scheme guidelines, so we'll okay. make sure that that goes out with everybody. Um, so the, obviously, this, the cost of the <laughs> screening, the actual examination is available on the website and obviously that's well not obviously but I think that's a relatively small amount compared to the cost of having the radiographs taken at your vet so it's yeah. more important to I think to see what the charge would be at your vets rather than necessarily the submission fee to the BBA. Completely and also obviously you do need to check with your individual vet because yeah. that will vary. Definitely. Okay. Moving swiftly on, I think we've also lost Jerry. So we have Jerry, lost Jerry, so we'll hope nothing should Jerry comes up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, could you um describe a little bit? I'm um, just thinking about breeding, the impacts a poor hip score can have on a dog that's carrying and delivering puppies. Well, I guess the biggest thing for me about that question is if you've got a poor hip score, then I personally don't think it's appropriate for the animal to be bred from because you are then potentially propagating the disease through the population. And that's the whole thing about, if we're going to go and score them, we need to then act on those scores and not breed from those affected patients. Hip dysplasia in itself shouldn't cause any particular problems to birth, but the increased weight of having a pregnant uterus inside will make those, as we talked about, having more weight on the joints will make them more uncomfortable. So having um, increased body weight because there's because of a pregnancy will result in that animal having more um, clinical signs associated with that. 
But I think the biggest point is if it's got a poor HIP score, don't breathe from it. Perfect, thank you. And a question we get pretty much in every web webinar when we're talking about screening is about neutering and whether you wanted to comment at all on the impact of early neutering, if there is one, uh, to the risks of elbow dysplasia or hip dysplasia, or if that's not relevant here. I don't think that's so relevant here. I mean, Jerry was thinking about this particular question, so if he does reappear, we can always ask him. But um, to my mind, um, there shouldn't be that much influence. And I think it's quite hard if there's any studies that says that there is an influence. I don't think you can really, you can definitely say that because you can't look at that individual animal without neutering it. You've either neutered it or you haven't. So it's yeah. difficult to say whether that animal is more or less likely to have developed dysplasia on account of that. But to me, it doesn't quite make sense that it would have any effect, really, providing we're not talking about ridiculously young neutering like 12 weeks or something, which I, I haven't been in general practice for a long time, but I, I don't think that would be appropriate. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And just um, again, as it was well covered throughout the presentations this evening, we know this is quite hard to kind of see and to see clinical signs of. But if a do dog owner specifically is concerned, what are the kind of early signs that you could really simply with no veterinary advice, if you were concerned about hip dysplasia or elbow dysplasia, uh, what are the clinical signs or behavioural signs that the, the dog may exhibit? Oh, well, there's such a wide range. That's really difficult to answer because um, anything, it, it's not specific to elbow or hip dysplasia, I guess is the thing. But, uh, so animals that show reluctance to go out on walks, well, that could be because they've got dysplasia or it could be because they've got some other problem. So I think that's that's probably, I would say, is if you are concerned, then it would be better to go to the, your own vet and to get your animal checked out because it might be due to dysplasia, but there could be so many other diseases, including you know infections, whole body infections that could be causing the problem, or it could be a behavioural thing. So I think it would be, yeah, difficult for me to really answer that question accurately. I think, Charlotte. Thank you. So we've got a very strong message there. As we said at the beginning, if you have any concerns, then you need to go to your vet. Perfect. So Jerry's back. So Jerry, I'm going to ask you a very technical specific question that we've had in and if I get it wrong in the beginning middle or end hopefully you'll still be able to understand me uh, so we've had a question why does the BVA score down bone spurs on elbows when another scheme doesn't um, as they do not consider them hereditary and why can the same elbow image receive three different scores well look the answer to the first question, I, or the first part of the question about the bone spurs, is as far as I'm aware, all the elbow schemes across the world follow the International Elbow Working Group's protocol, which we talked about earlier on. And I wonder if somebody's got the idea that bone spurs are something specific. Bone spur is a just another word for an osteophyte or arthritic new bone. They're all one and the three are the, the, exactly the same thing. And so we measure osteophytes or, or bony spurs, whatever you want to call them, or osteoarthritis. And we measure them, as we said earlier on, as less than two millimetres, two to five millimetres, and more than five millimetres to get grade ones, two and threes. And as far as I'm aware, all the other schemes, for instance, the OFA in the United States, do exactly the same. So I'm not quite sure where that, how that's come about, other than perhaps this rather confusing, and that's vet's fault, or medic, medical parlance for using lots of different words for the same thing. Um, so I think uh, that's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question, I just repeat it for me. It's... Uh... Why can the same elbow image receive three different scores? Well, the whole game is one of assessment. A human being is looking at something and interpreting what they see. And it's entirely possible that two different people 
So say a radiologist in Australia or a radiologist, a veterinary radiologist in America or one in the UK may all look at the same picture and they may interpret it differently and you might end up with different scores or different grades. Now that's why we believe the situation in the UK where we use two scrutineers will minimise the chances of uh, what you might call a rogue interpretation taking place because it's not un uncommon that I might be sitting with Lizza or one of my other colleagues and we will disagree about something we, we see and we'll be saying is that part of the dog or is it actually some new bone, an osteophyte, a bony spur, something abnormal that shouldn't be there and needs to be measured? And I think if there are two people to discuss and decide, you're more likely to be accurate. And I think, as Lynn said earlier on, occasionally a pair of scrutineers won't be able to agree, and they then may pull that case out of the day's scoring and pass it to the chief scrutineer for yet another look. And what I sometimes will do is then say, I'm not sure, let's put it into the next session and there'll be yet more, another two pairs of eyes to look at it. Um, so it's really, the whole thing is a matter of interpretation and there will be differences of opinion. That's all about medicine in general. Perfect. That's, that's a really, really in-depth answer and I appreciate that. You have both, and um, we've taken up a lot of your time. You've given um, a really, really detailed presentation this evening. I'm sure this is a topic we will revisit. Uh, I'm coming back to pricing. So single submission um, to for the scheme is £73.50. Joint hip and elbow is £133.50. But obviously, as we said earlier, um, you do need to go to your individual vet as well um, to discuss the screening um, and their individual prices. So we've just covered off that question um, from earlier, Lisa. Thanks, I sir. want to say thank you so much um, to Jerry and Lisa for being here. We really hope that everyone has enjoyed the webinar. Um, it's a really important topic. We will come back to this. Um, if you are interested in any way, we have so many links. Uh, the British Veterinary Association Canine Health Schemes website is full of information on how to um, participate in the scheme. Um, the Kennel Club website has a lot of information about estimated breeding values, about um, mean scores for breeds, for information and data collected on individual breeds over many, many years. And um, if you feel lost, then just email health at thekennelclub.org.uk. We are more than happy to help you with breeding advice. We're more than happy to help you get started with hip and elbow dysplasia screening. Um, so everything will be online. You will receive a short survey. Um, again, if you're lost, please email health at thekennelclub.org.uk um, and please do visit the Kennel Club's YouTube channel um, to access this webinar and many others on important health topics. So thank you again so much for this evening and uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you and goodbye. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye.